Greetings and welcome to the pre-concert talk for Mozart Horn Concertos. This is airing on April the 15th. I'm going to have a lot of fun with this one because the soloists are two of my colleagues in the brass section. Uh, that's part of the reason why I'm here in my basement this time by myself uh, instead of in front of the green screen because it's safer to do some demonstrations of brass instruments down here. Now our principal horn player, Alana Despin, will be performing the third of Mozart's four horn concertos. And our second horn player, Mike Oswald, will be performing the second horn concerto, appropriately enough. Also on the program is an arrangement for strings of the lovely string sextet that opens Richard Strauss's opera Capriccio. Uh, this is an opera that we've performed before. Uh, we did it as part of the Pacific Opera production in 2010. Now both Mozart and Strauss put opera very much at the center of their repertoire. Both composers had a strong affinity for the horn. Richard Strauss was actually the son of Franz Strauss, a professional horn player, and uh, he wrote two horn concertos himself, not to mention the superhero horn parts that he wrote in his tone poems, like Don Juan and uh, Ein Heldenleben. Now it's tone poems like that and the role of the horns in late romantic music, uh, especially Wagner's operas, that really ultimately led to the horn's place in modern cinema scores. So you, you can't have an epic film score without lots of horn. Now you'll remember when I talked about the 21st piano concerto of Mozart that Lorraine Min recently performed with us. I talked a lot about how opera shaped Mozart's instrumental writing and that's true of these horn concertos too. The second movements especially are these beautiful lyrical arias. They're basically like operatic arias for the horn. But the final movements are really great character, opera character studies for the horn. And the final movements of all of Mozart's horn concertos are in what we call 6-8 time. All that means is that there are six eighth notes in each bar and they're grouped in groups of three. So Joey actually conducts in two. So one, two, one, two. But the rhythm goes by one, two, three, four, five, six, one. And you hear a lot of these horse hoof rhythms. Dun, digga dun, digga dun, digga dun, digga dun. So that brings us to the origins of the horn itself. Now, first of all, the name, the instrument that we know is simply the horn, we sometimes in the English speaking world, world call it the French horn. And the only reason we do that is because a lot of the sort of development of the horn as an orchestral instrument took place in France. That's the only reason we call them French horns, because they're not really French. They were very international. It's always been a very international instrument. So the term gives a nod to its origin in France, but whenever we speak of the horn, we generally don't use an adjective. So if I say horn, I mean the instruments that you're going to hear on this program. It's, an, it's ironic that in jazz and in blues and R&B music, when you talk about horns, the horn section of Earth, Wind and Fire, for example, there are no horns in a horn section. They're all saxophones and trombones and trumpets. So music terminology is a really confusing mess sometimes. Now the horn had its origins in the instruments played as signaling horns on horseback. Uh, now the horn of Mozart's time when these concertos were written wasn't that different from the older hunting horns, but it was dramatically different from the modern instruments that Alana and Mike are going to play. In fact, all of the instruments of the orchestra are dramatically different from Mozart's time. It's just that some of the differences are harder to see. You don't see it in the strings as much as you do in the winds and brass. So to demonstrate the horn, I've put together a little demo for you. Now, some of you might know the musicians of the Victoria Symphony occasionally form small groups to go out and do concerts in schools. The low brass does this a lot. Uh, we go and we play for the kids, we talk to them, we, tell, we demonstrate our instruments, we talk a little bit about the history of the music that we're performing, very much like what I'm doing in this video, but for kids. And one of the things that we do is we demonstrate how brass instruments work. And to do that, I'm going to use this abomination here. Oh. 
Now this is a horn that's made from PVC piping with a funnel at one end. This is my bass trombone mouthpiece at the other. As weird and as strange as this looks, this is more or less like the hunting horn in D, in the key of D. It's pretty much like the instruments that they carried on horseback. They pointed backward, which is uh, to signal to the rear and to not deafen the horses. Now, when they started fashioning these out of metal, they discovered that they could, if they were all built to a, a, a good standard and they were all the same length, they discovered that it was really fun to play these things together in groups. And it became a thing uh, to play these group horn calls. There are still places in the world where they do this, even though its association with actual hunting, thankfully, has long been severed. Hunting's been banned throughout most of the world, and rightly so. But the tradition of playing the hunting horns is alive and well, especially in places like France. Now, if you've never heard what hunting horns sound like as a group, I'm going to play you a short excerpt here. And I'm going to warn you right now, if you're wearing earbuds while you're listening to this, you might want to take them out. Uh, and in any case, you'll want to be really quick on the volume button because, my friends, this is loud. instruments are limited in the notes that they can play. They can only play the notes of what is called the harmonic series. Now the easiest way to explain the harmonic series is that it's a series of notes that are integer multiples of a fundamental. Now what does that mean? Um, well the fundamental is the lowest note that you can play on a tube like this or on a string or by striking a resonant object of some sort. It's basically one standing wave inside that runs the entire length of this tube. Now on this thing, it's this rather flatulent sounding D. Now I've written that D out two ways here, one with ledger lines and the other with the octave lower symbol. And I'm showing you the frequency of that D give or take, is about 36.7 hertz. That means it's making your eardrum vibrate back and forth about 30, a little over 36 times every second. Now, the way the physics of this tube works is as I increase the pressure by closing the aperture between my lips and moving the air faster with my breathing muscles, the wave divides into two even parts and then three, and then four, and then so on. If you're playing harmonics on a string, for example, the wave divisions look something like this. Now, they're always equal length divisions within the tube. You don't get one that's longer than the other. And for each of the, these harmonics, I'm gonna label them H2, H3, H4, and so on. Like I said, it's an integer multiple of that 36.7 Hertz D. That's just a mathematician's way of saying x times 2, x times 3, x times 4, etc. So this makes the second harmonic, H2, exactly twice the frequency of the fundamental. And then the third harmonic is exactly three times the frequency of the fundamental. And then H4 is four times the frequency of the fundamental, and so on. So I'll play the first 12 notes of this series, and I'll show you up here somewhere where each, each note in musical notation, and I'll show you the math that it, uh, calculates each frequency. Now these values are gonna be really approximate because this thing is not very sophisticated. Okay, here we go. So aside from the 
obvious problems with the material that this is made out of and the dimensions, this rather crude horn, you can see that making music on a fixed length tube is going to give you some limitations. First of all, the notes at the bottom end of this series are really far apart, so you can't really do much with them, uh, melodically speaking. Now the other problem, and this gets a little bit more complicated, is that with the other instruments like the voice and the keyboard instruments and strings, remember our friend the octave? Now we eventually decided to divide that octave into more or less 12 equal parts. Now even in the 18th century, while those semitones weren't exactly equal, they were pretty close. And the mathematics of these harmonics don't always line up with the notes in the tempered scale. Now in a lot of music, this was just conveniently ignored, especially when the music was written on a really grand scale, like this excerpt from one of George Friedrich Handel's famous water music suites. Check out the horns in this. <laughs> that those horn players are really adept at trills moving very very rapidly between adjacent notes of a scale. Brass players actually practice daily exercises to be able to do that, to be able to move really quickly and cleanly between harmonics. <laughs> Now you'll notice in that handle movement, one of the, those trills, uh, you'll notice that the violins and oboes had no problem with this interval. But in the horns, that interval is, is almost like that. It's almost that sharp. It actually falls in between those notes. Uh, around um, that time, they would have just ignored that. They would have just, oh well, we'll just play it with reckless abandon and enjoy ourselves. But around Handel's time in the mid 18th century, horn players started playing more complicated music and they started developing a way to work around those limitations. And because of the position of the bell on this instrument, you can stick your hand in the end and you can cheat some of these notes a little bit. You can modify them what you're basically doing is squashing the length of the vibrating column of air just slightly with your hand. And you can change the pitch of some of these notes. So instead of this, I'm going to put my hand in the bell and I'm going to show you how I can play a whole scale in that range. Now, this is obviously not a good instrument to demonstrate this on, and I'm obviously not the person to do it as well. At the end of this video, I'm going to recommend a couple of uh, videos to you that will illustrate this much better than I can. Now, 
Obviously, the instruments that Alana and Mike are going to play have valves. These were first invented well after Mozart's death. Uh, in the earliest known valves were invented in the teen years of the 1800s. What they did was they quickly routed the air into loops that changed the length of the instrument. Uh, the instrument still worked exactly the same way with the same harmonic series, but instead of being just limited to one harmonic series at a time, with three valves you could play seven different harmonic series, so that filled in the whole gaps of the range of the instrument. Now most modern horn players in the present day, they actually play what are called double horns. Uh, what that means is they have two full columns of crooks attached to three valves and they switch back and forth between the longer set of crooks and the shorter set of crooks by means of a thumb valve. So there you go, a quick and dirty history of the horn. Uh, finally, I'm going to say a word about the person for whom these concertos were written. He was a court horn player from Vienna and he was a friend of Mozart's family named Josef Leutgeb. Now, at the intermission of this concert that you're going to see, our CEO, Matthew, is going to interview Alana and Mike, and they're going to talk a little bit about the friendship between Mozart and Leutgeb. Uh, thankfully, some of the playfulness and good humor of that relationship has survived in the form of some very amusing annotations that Mozart wrote in the score of his first horn concerto. He wrote it in the line right above the horn part in the score. It's almost a running commentary where he's poking fun at Leutgeb. He writes things like, come on, get on with it. Uh, oh, what horrible intonation. And in true Mozart fashion, as only he could in one part, he writes, oh, what a pain in the balls. But rather than putting all that text in this video, I'm gonna recommend the YouTube channel of the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. I would definitely check them out. And these two videos in particular, one is called Mozart's Naughty Notes, and you can see that those annotations in the score over top of a real-time performance of the Mozart Horn Concerto. And another one is called Introducing Mozart's Horn, and that's with their principal horn player, Roger Montgomery. He demonstrates the whole hand-stopping technique and how you get all of those different notes in a much, much better way than I ever could with that silly uh, plastic horn. You can find those videos uh, via the search function in YouTube, and I highly recommend them. In fact, I recommend subscribing to the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment's YouTube channel, because they're uh, uh, way ahead of the curve in production of interesting and educational videos about musical instruments, music theory, music history, and other related topics. So that's it for now. As always, uh, don't hesitate to ask me anything in the comments or through the Victoria Symphony's contact email, and I'll see you on the next show.